Hi, friends. This is Dory Clark. I am here for Newsweek, and our program is better. Every Thursday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, we are talking to you about how to improve your life, how to make things better. And today we are going to be talking about the concept of effortlessness. That is something that during the pandemic we have all been striving for. Everything feels so hard <laughs> over the past now, you know, 14 months, right? So the real question is, you know, how can we understand better how to make it easier to do what matters most? And so as part of the effort to, uh, to discuss these great concepts, we are going to have a guest today. It is Greg McEwen. He is the author of the book, Effortless. He's going to be joining us momentarily, and uh, it's exciting to get to talk to him. You might be familiar with Greg from his million-selling book. I mean, these days, check that out, right? A million-seller, uh, Essentialism, which came out a few years ago. So Greg has actually just joined the stream, and I am going to give this a go. Let's see if we can bring Greg in. I'm not sure if the picture is working yet. Greg, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I sure can. Although, unfortunately, you are you are a mystery man right now with a black <laughs> square. Uh, here we go. We're gonna try try something with it. Yeah. All right, let's make it happen, my man. I'm excited to uh, to talk with you, and I know that our viewers are as well. <laughs> well, it's nice it's nice to be with you. I know that we're uh, we're, we're we're just going audio here, but it's so it's such a pleasure. Thank you. I I, I love being with you. Well, thank you. That is great. Well, as you are working on the audio settings, I'm, I will just uh, dial back to me here. And in the meantime, I'd actually love to see who is here in the audience. So if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat box who you are and where you are from, we'd love to give you a shout out. And of course, we're going to be taking your questions during the live stream. So feel free to start putting them into the chat box. We want to hear what's on your mind when it comes to effortlessness, essentialism, and all things great. Greg McEwen. So we're very excited about all of that. We want to hear from you. So Greg, the, the first question that I have for you, and we'll, <laughs> we'll give this, we'll give this a go. It's, it's still, still a black square. So we can, we can perhaps keep toggling a little bit, but uh, what, I, <laughs> what I'm very curious about uh, and would love your perspective is that ultimately you know, you're writing a book called Effortless. I think all of us would love to be there during the pandemic that's kind of in the opposite of most people's experience. Things feel so hard. They feel so laborious. What has been your perspective about the past year and ways that we can begin to just turn the dial a little bit more in the direction away from effortful and toward effortless? Well, I think there's two kinds of people in the world right now. I think there are people who are burned out. And then I think there are people who know they are burned out. Uh, and it's actually quite a, a, an achievement to get into the second category because one of the things I found in my research for Effortless was that, that the more burned out a person is, the less likely they are to know about it because all the things that make it hard to know, you know, all, all, all the factors of burnout, uh, it, they, it makes you un, less clear uh, about all sorts of things. As you approach burnout, you you discern more poorly uh, you know, what's going on in your relationships. You start to take things personally that aren't intended to be personal and so on. Like it affects our ability to discern in all sorts of settings, including our ability to discern how we're doing. And so it 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 puts us in risk of a downward spiral where we, we say, well, you know, I can see things aren't quite working. So I'll double down, I'll power through, I'll do even more, I'll push even harder. And so it, th this is something I think a lot of people have done over the last 16 months. And sometimes they've achieved results by doing it, but it's come at a great cost. And sometimes, as I say, the cost isn't even obvious. So I think that's like step one is to, to just get in the second category and go, well, what, you know, what are the costs that this other approach, this grinding effort approach um, has, has, has what that impact has been to me to my relationships, to my team, uh, and and then say, well, how can we get results in a different way going forward? 
Yeah, I think that's such an important question to be asking, Greg. That's that's great, and thank you so much. And just in the spirit of seeing if uh, you know, so so these uh, kind folks can hopefully have a, a chance to see your smiling face. Perhaps while I say hello to our great uh, folks who are tuning in here, we see so many people from around the world. Perhaps you might uh, log out and log in again to see yeah, if we have right. a chance of getting your picture. I'll do that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Greg. All right. So I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to Francis for tuning in from Puerto Rico. Bernhard is here from Munich. Hi, Bernhard. We have Vicky from Texas, uh, Sherry from uh, Chicago. We have Veronica from New Jersey. Oh my gosh, we've got New York City in the house. Uh, we have Linda from Michigan, Jeff from Seattle, Christy from London, Matthew from Illinois, and more and more. This is incredible. Thank you so much. We are talking today about how to make it easier to do what matters most. I'm actually curious if you can type into the chat box right now, you know, April of 2021, as we're, we're filming this, we're about 14 months into the pandemic situation. Do you personally feel like your situation in terms of like frenzy, burnout, all the things that we've experienced is, is it, has it gotten better? Are we on an upward spiral or is it just as bad as it was a year ago or has it actually gotten worse? I would be very curious to hear what your experience has been. I know for me personally, um, there, there was, I've probably never been busier in my life than the first two months of the pandemic because I was so concerned that I would never earn money again. Uh, I thought I thought we were going to go into zombie land, and so I, I worked myself into exhaustion. But I'd be curious to hear what it is that you guys are experiencing. And we have Greg McEwen back in the house. Hi, Greg. Hey, there we go. That's better, isn't it? That's nicer. <laughs> it's so much better. I love it. Thank you so much. So we're really happy to have you here. I was also curious. Um, Greg, one um, one question when it comes to the concept of effortlessness, you know, to a certain extent. I think most of us are aware what makes us happy. We're we're aware that spending more time with with family and friends is valuable, or mm -hmm. you know, doing deep work on meaningful projects is valuable. And yet, it almost seems like there's this inexorable inexorable pull toward the trivial. And at the mm -hmm. end of the day, we say, "Oh, well, what did I even accomplish? Why is it so hard to focus on what matters most?" I think that what the pull is, isn't to the trivial. I think the pull is to the easy. So what we perceive as hard, we will pull away from. And what we perceive as easy. We, what, what we perceive as easy, uh, we will be pulled towards. And so a lot of people and a lot of leaders believe and will state as categorical fact, no one even questions it. Well, this thing is going to be really important. It's going to be really hard, but it's going to be really worth it. They just state it. And, and I've watched leaders do it. And from now on, people can do it. They'll watch that this is done and no one says anything about it because it's taken as just a truism. And so then it sets up this false dichotomy between the essential and overwhelming on the one hand and the trivial and easy on the other. And so when people have to choose between those two, they want to say, well, let's do the essential. That really matters. There's not a lack of motivation, but it just is too, it's just overwhelming. It's too much. So then they want to pull into, well, I'll just, I'll just check social media. I'll just go on, you know, whatever ESPN, I'll just do the, I'll go to email. They'll do the things that are easier to do and perceived as easier. But the whole question, and you know, this is one of the drivers of this new book, is to say, well, what if you could make the essential things, the most essential things, the easiest thing in your life? What if you could just stack the decks in your favor? That could change everything. I mean, it does change everything. And, and maybe not everything can be made effortless, but what if some of those things that in the past you just – you know, pushed away from, you suddenly could embrace because it, it, it in fact was easier to do and therefore do consistently and therefore break through to the next level, but without burning out. 
It's a powerful question to be asking, and the book is effortless. This is the new book by Greg McEwen. You can learn more about him at his website right here, gregmcewen.com. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek sessions, you can subscribe to my email list at doryclark.com to get regular updates about our fantastic guests. So, Greg, the logical next question for people who have not yet had the opportunity to read your book, which just came out two days ago, is, all right, where do we start? I, I buy in, I believe it. I want to make the most important things effortless. How do I do it, Greg? What would you tell them? Uh, I think that you just have to define, really answer two questions. So, so I wrote a book, as you've already mentioned, Essentialism. Uh, and that really, in one word, is prioritization. And then the new book is uh, Effortless. And in one word, it's Simplification. And I think of them as being cousins or siblings. Like they stand alone, they're separate, but together... Uh, is where the magic happens. To use a presumptuous example, a British example, uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon both created music separately, but the magic happened when you did it, you know, they did it together in the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So in, in a, hopefully a little similar way, uh, essentialism and effortless work together. So two questions just to get the thing going uh, is, you know, what is something that's essential that you know would be a game changer to your business, to your career, or just personal life, something that you already know matters. So you don't have to overthink that. And then immediately, once you've identified that, you just start with, like, how can you make it effortless? And there's a series of questions you can ask to, to start getting there. But that question alone is one that we often don't ask. In fact, my, my experience is that literally almost never do people ask that question. Uh, and, and so as a result, they're asking other questions like, well, how can I work harder to achieve this goal? How can I put in more effort? Because their brains give them answers to that question, to those alternative questions. So if you start with, like, how can it be effortless? Uh, here are a few other specific things you can ask. How can I make it enjoyable? Uh, how can I, you know, what does done look like? So I'm not just forever spinning. What's the first obvious step that I can take, the very first action? Uh, how can I remove you know, what's the, what, the, what are the fewest steps necessary to get to completion? But all these questions help to guide someone through a sort of personal application of essentialism and effortless. As one example, I was just uh, talking with somebody. Uh, I, I said, okay, what's essential for you? They said, eating healthy. If I could do that, I know it would make a huge difference to my sense of well-being even to my career, because I just feel more confident in what I'm trying to achieve each day, give myself better fuel. And so we went through the questions, well, how could you make it effortless? He said, well, I suppose one effortless way would be uh, to, to set, set one of these uh, automatic um, you know, delivery services. I said, okay, well, what, what does done look like? Well, done, done looks like my credit card's in, it's scheduled, it's done, we, we, you know, that would be done. That's how I would know I was there. What's the very first action? Go into Google, search for that. Uh, what could you what could you do within the first ten minutes in a micro burst? He said, and he, he like just paused it, not awkwardly, but like this quite poignant pause. He's like, in ten minutes, I could do everything. I could sign up, I could set it up, and it would work in perpetuity. And that, that was quite a, it was like a quite a lovely moment. And I said, how long have you been struggling with this? He said, twenty years, and and we're like 10 minutes to solve it. And that's, you know when you're in effortless territory and he found himself there because he like just relaxed. I mean, we we're doing like, like we're doing now. It was like in person, he just relaxed. And he was like, I can do this. I can do this. Instead of taking the torturous journey, the hard journey, well, I've got to make the food. I've got to do it. I've got to, I've got to discipline myself. I've got to really, we just said we, we found a whole different path. It was always there, but he hadn't been asking those questions. So I think if somebody asks these questions, sometimes you'll find a new answer that you didn't have before. Yeah, it's a powerful reminder, Greg, that in just a short period of time, you really can change the game. And Richard uh, typed in a great example here. He says, effortless is setting a personal rule where I work out every morning, no matter what. It's easy to go daily now. So good job, Richard. Can, can we just play on that for a second with Richard? Because because first of all, I love that. Um, yes, you have done something to make it effortless. You've made one decision that makes a thousand. You, you're saying, let's take out the 
um, the, the cognitive work that is effort, right? Effort is cognitive work. So you've removed that. You've said, I'm doing, I've made my decision once instead of every single day. Am I going to do it? When am I going to do it? What am I going to do? And that's just enough. You don't have to make something very full of friction to not do it. You just have to have enough that you go, oh, that feels overwhelming. It just feels a bit too much today to then not do it. But I want to also build on something Richard's saying here to, to, to extend it further. Because there's three categories of sort of ways of trying to do something that's essential. One is to treat it like a chore. It's important, but I'm going to muscle through this. I don't want to do it, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway, right? There's a chore. The second, and this is what I see Richard doing here, is to set a habit. Okay, once it's habitual, that makes it easier because for all the reasons we've just discussed. But there's another level, there's a third gear that's more rare, and that is to turn it into a ritual. Now, often people use the term habits and rituals interchangeably. Uh, and, and it's the same, but I think of them very differently. A, a habit is what you do. A ritual is how you do it. And why that matters is because a habit is something you do for some future reward. You exercise so that you feel better afterwards. You exercise so that you're healthy in the future and live longer. Those are all good reasons to do it. But a ritual is distinct because it's like a habit with a soul. The way you do it is itself enjoyable. You look forward to doing it because this thing has become something that itself is meaningful. And I'm not saying it isn't for Richard, it might be. But but I wanted to just make that distinction. So someone could say, I mean, I've had people, who, I'm, I'm running, I need to run. It's like a chore. Do you like running? I hate running, but I need to do it. Well, that's not the only way to exercise. You know, you could find something you enjoy recently, only the, the last couple of weeks. So I don't want to overstate how well we're doing, but, but uh, took up swimming again because I love swimming and I love swimming with my children. And if I can get them to do, and we'll just go and do laps together, uh, th that's enjoyable. It's a ritual in and of itself. It's its own reward. And so with the right type of approach, by trying, for example, to link the thing that's essential with something you already find enjoyable, you'd already do, you'd already want to do, you can construct rituals that are meaningful, enjoyable, and therefore you're going to keep doing them because you, you're looking forward to it. It's aligned. It's a really great point, Greg. And in fact, uh, back a few weeks ago, we actually had a guest, Erica Keswin, who was talking about her new book, Rituals Roadmap, uh, mm. which talked about some of these key categories as well. So I, I think that's a great insight. So I am curious, Greg, we had a LinkedIn user um, write in, and I'll just mention for anyone tuning in live, please type your questions into the chat box. We'd love to hear what is on your mind and the questions you have for author Greg McEwen. But one of our viewers on LinkedIn typed in, the elevated nonstop pace feels more crushing than ever with no stops for air now in 14 months. I think probably a lot of people are feeling that way. If you are already at a point where you feel burned out past your limit, what are the things that we can do to sort of rouse ourselves to the point of clarity where we're even able to perceive the steps that we can take to make things more effortless? One of the things that the pandemic did is it removed the remaining few boundaries between work uh, and, and everything else. So there used to at least be a geographical boundary. Maybe you would be able to, uh, you know, you'd have a commute or you'd have, you know, you'd have a flight somewhere. So that would sort of create some space and buffer. The, like geography was like our last boundary. Uh, there wasn't much of one because technology went with us everywhere. But as soon as you combine those together, we, that's why when we start working from home, well, it's not work from home. We're living at work. That's we all heard that phrase. But that's why, because it was already tilted in favor of corporatism and work and, and, and so on. And just this, the, 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 there were few boundaries remaining. Right now, if you don't construct boundaries, there won't be any. And, and so that's one of the reasons I think this relentless pace is, is, you know, it's the Zoom, eat, sleep, repeat type experience where we look at a Fitbit at the end of the day, and it literally is like 300 steps, if that. 
I mean, this is because there are no boundaries. So you, you can construct some boundaries and, you know, let me share, I think maybe two that I think could be helpful. Uh, one is to create a done for the day list uh, where you actually say at the beginning of the day, uh, what are the things that I need to do today that I will feel satisfied, enough satisfied that I can be done, that I can actually say, okay, that's it for now. I'm going to actually now have time that I also construct to relax and to recuperate. Um, so a done for the day list, I think, is is better than just the, the endless to-do list, which often gets longer by the end of the day than it is at the beginning. So that's one thing, a done for the day list. The second thing related to it is to have a set time to end your day. Uh, I was inspired by Ben Bergeron, who used to do this and did it for years, three years. He was actually tracking it. Ben Bergeron works with sort of the some of the fittest athletes in the world, elite athletes. And so he's a disciplined person himself. And he said, OK, I'm going to end work. For him, he chose 525. And that meant that he could drive home by six o'clock. And he followed this on a, you know, on a spreadsheet. And he achieved it about 75 percent of the time, which was, I think, a great sort of goal, giving yourself a little space for sometimes there'll be unexpected things, but your norm is to have a set time. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I th when I learned about this from him, I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I chose five o'clock uh, because it took a bit of self-awareness. I, you know, I'm married to Anna, I've got, we've got four children. If I went later, everything got harder. Dinner is harder. If I come out and I'm hungry and everyone else is hungry and everyone else is tired, everything just becomes more stressful than what I think of as the last act of the day, a uh, you know, three act play and this is the last act. Uh, and so if I got out of five, I could help with dinner, I can help rally people, we can get together, the dinner is more enjoyable together, the, the cleanup is easier because etc. So I would do it like a town crier, I would go out like it was a bit weird, but it helped me stay accountable. And I would yell it out to the family. Okay, it's 4.59 or it's five o'clock or whatever time I managed to make it out, which meant it was awkward if it was 5.23 or later because they all knew the goal is five o'clock. So that's one of the things that I did to help keep me accountable. And these are just a couple of things I think that people can start doing, uh, at least experimenting with to create boundaries so that they aren't just completely endlessly in this like forever loop of work uh, and, and living at work. Those are great tangible strategies, Greg. Obviously, as you say, the boundaries have really blurred and it does become much harder. So I think people can really make good use of that. So a question came in that I thought seemed, uh, seemed very relevant and it ties in with something you were mentioning earlier. Maria was curious. She said, how would you address the instant gratification of the easy, for instance, just turning on Netflix versus the essential when you are feeling burned out. It's it's very easy for us to want to gravitate to things that require no, um, no mental effort, I guess. How can we just break out of that slump? Well, I mean, my, my first thought about this is, is just not to be so super hard on ourselves about turning on Netflix as being a super, a big non-essential. Uh, I think there is a place uh, in the environment that we've been in to just create space that just, I mean, the, the whole point of entertainment, you know, good entertainment is that you get to have a release. You're giving your mind a break. It doesn't have to be conjuring up thoughts. It is just being given something to just enjoy, make you laugh and so on. So I think in its place, we don't have to just be, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. I I, I, I always really want to put on Netflix for, for a bit at the end of the day. Okay, I think there's a place for it. The, the only thing I would say beyond it is, is just to make sure you, well, to try to construct rituals that are in fact relaxing and rejuvenating. Now, if, if Netflix does that, you know, then, then I think the right portion of that can be good. If you, if, like many overachievers, you don't really know the answer to what relaxes you, then you kind of need to start this idea. It's like take that re relaxing is a responsibility. Or said differently, relaxing is a competency. And you actually have to learn how to do it. And one way to do that is to, is to start listing out. We start with 10 items. My wife and I have done 20 now, but you know, start with 10 things that are like joyful for you, enjoyable, relaxing, rejuvenating. At first, when we first started this, 
both of us, it's just like we don't, we don't know. <laughs> and so we had to like pay attention. What things are just, just good and we enjoy doing them. And so, you know, now Anna's, you know, read fiction. She really likes that. That's more rejuvenating for her than, uh, than, than going on Netflix. So she's learned that. And so this is, this is, it's good for me that she's found that, that, you know, that's one of 20 things, but because, because we, both of us want to get to a point where you, your work for the day gets to be done. And then there's no more sneaky work after that. That's what we call it. No sneaky work. There's no like, you know, sitting in the bath and being, you know, searching on Amazon while you're, you know, to buy something for, for the family. There's no, you know, being in a hot tub and being on email. Like we want to be able to divide it so you give your mind and body a break. Why? Because, you know, the biology is simple, but that it's like a slingshot. If you can really unplug, if you can really give your mind space to rest and relax, get into a more effortless state, then you'll be able to leap forward in your creativity and your productivity the next day. So this is, you know, this is part of the natural, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the, 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 the rhythm of life that you need in, in order to perform at a high level. Back in the 80s, you know, 70s, 80s, in, in elite sports, in elite performance, uh, people believed you just have to be on all the time. You just, the more practice, the better, the more hours, the more time we can spend on the pitch, the more is better. And what the research has shown over the last 20 years is that that is totally not the case. The top performance requires, yes, intense sessions, but also a lot of space to recuperate and, and to be able to, to relax those, that, that body, the mind, so that when you're on, you can be fully on, you can be fully present. But when you're off, you can also be fully present, but now on relaxing uh, and, and so on. So there's a couple of thoughts. Thank you, Greg. That's great. And if you are tuning in and enjoying this conversation, you can learn more about Greg. His new book is called Effortless, and you can check out his website at gregmcewen.com. If you want to make sure that you are signed up to tune in every Thursday to our Newsweek series, you can subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter, doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, and you will get updates about all our fantastic guests like Greg. Greg, we probably have time for one more question. And I think something that I'm curious about, I'm sure a lot of our viewers are as well, it, it certainly sounds like a great idea. And I'm seeing a lot in the chat box about people uh, praising your idea of, of really having a firm stop time for your work. Um, but, you know, I can imagine for a lot of professionals, and especially you, you're, you're a busy author, you've got a, a book launch, uh, a lot of people want your consulting services. This must mean saying no to a lot of things, because I'm sure you could fill an extra two or three hours per day by accepting commitments. How do you have the strength of will to say no and overcome the uh, the FOMO that a lot of people might have. I think I think that has a lot to do with giving your brain a better option. Uh, I mean, for example, with essentialism, where I really treated a lot of the, the theme of what you're asking. Um, uh, it, it, you know, I didn't write a book about how to say no to everyone and everything. That would be a different book, Noism. Um, you know, the book was essentialism. And it really is about saying yes to the things that are most essential. I mean, that's the that's where you get the, the 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 courage from is out of the clarity around what actually matters most. So that you say, look, smilingly, happily, you say no to something because you have a clearer yes over here. If you don't get clear about what your essentials are, then you say yes to things unaware that you're saying no to what's essential. And, and that idea that that every yes is a trade-off, in fact, every yes is saying no to 10 other things, becomes quite an empowering idea where you start to say, well, hold on, uh, I, I, I want to be clear. I mean, it, I mean, part of the, you know, the journey of essentialism and effortless all began uh, when, uh, when it, with a personal uh, mistake on my part, uh, when I was, um, I received an email from my manager at the time that said, look, Friday between 1 and 2 p.m. would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby because uh, <laughs> I need to be at this client meeting. And uh, I'm sure they were joking, uh, 
but I still, you know, on Friday, we're in the hospital, a daughter's just been born, and I'm feeling torn. How do I keep everybody happy? I've got really no boundaries. Uh, and that, that's, that's on me. I've got my laptop open, I've got my phone open, I'm trying to, you know, support Anna. But, but I think if I can do it all, then uh, I can have it all. And I, to my shame, went to the client meeting. And afterwards, even afterwards, I remember my manager saying, well, look, the, uh, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. Um, and, and the look on their faces didn't evince that sort of respect. But even if they had, it's clear I made a fool's bargain. that I violated something uh, more important for something less important. And what I learned was if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Uh, and that's true in so many ways. And, and in our lives right now, it is also true. Uh, it's true for prioritization. It's also true for just setting up boundaries so that we don't just default to everything is a default yes. And we'll just keep going and going and going. Uh, you know, it's to, to get clear about what actually is the higher priority uh, first and then to set boundaries in place so that it's easier to maintain that as you go along. Uh, and, and as you start to construct meaningful rituals of relaxation, rituals that are rejuvenating, that are rejuvenating for you and for the relationships that matter most to you, you start to feel more at peace about not doing these other things because you know this is good stuff right now. I look forward to doing this as well. An overachiever, is, it's not good to put an overachiever in a position where their choices are more work that could be productive and then blank space that feels awkward and uncomfortable. They're going to simply want to get back to the first because that's the better option. But as you construct and design a life you don't want to escape from, uh, a life that is meaningful and so on, uh, that, that, uh, that, that rejuvenates you and is joyful for you, uh, then, then suddenly you say, well, no, I'm happy. I'm happy to put that aside. I'm happy to partake, partake of these good rituals and these new things uh, that, that themselves are more meaningful. That's that's good thing for now if you set it as a ritual, but it also pays enormous di dividends down uh, the line as well. Such great advice. Thank you so much. We're here with Greg McEwen, author of Effortless. You can learn more at gregmcewen.com. Thank you, Greg, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.